Hello everybody. It's my great pleasure to welcome you here at the first panel of our conference, Fall 2018 Institute Conference. And the topic of this panel is place-based policies. And I am very excited to introduce our panelists, our speakers today. We have three of the best experts on the topic we could possibly um, you know, uh, host today. So um, what we're going to do is to have half an hour uh, presentation by each of our speakers. And so you have to hold on your great questions for the end when we're going to have an entire half an hour just for Q&A. And so we will be having all your questions you know, for our speakers at the same time. And um, so today we're going to start uh, uh, with uh, Janet Curry from Princeton. She will be uh, talking about um, you know, some very specific place-based policies, which is hydraulic fracturing and uh, looking at the impact of these policies on health, on the health of uh, uh, children that aren't even born yet. And I remember one of your lectures a long time ago on the Eli lecture that you gave that was so inspiring about how inequality may start so early and be affected you know, by uh, things that we don't even notice all around us, very local. And then uh, Nathan Hendren from Harvard will give us uh, an entire perspective about the atlas of uh, neighborhood opportunities and how different neighborhoods in different census tracts in the United States uh, being raised in different census tracts can actually affect outcome in the long run significantly. And uh, after that, uh, David will say, David Author for MIT will also talk about the uh, effects of these neighborhoods and this place-based um, policies as well and thinking about what if in, you know, you're not just growing up in a poor neighborhood but in a poor neighborhood where people have lost their jobs how that will affect you know um, people around you and long-term outcomes and what can we do about it so it's a fascinating uh, topic and I am uh, excited to introduce our first speaker Janet Curry from Princeton okay thank you so um, if you are a policymaker and you're thinking about a depressed area where people are leaving, employment is falling, there's lots of deaths of despair and, and so on, and you could come up with a whole new industry and immediately increase employment, increase income, uh, and so on, you would probably think that was a wonderful thing. Um, and in many respects, that's what fracking did. Uh, and so what I'm going to talk about um, today, although I have somebody else's slides in front of me here, are, what I'm going to talk about today is fracking in a lot of detail to say well, what exactly happened and how is it different in different areas. Um, do I, I have a clicker? Uh, so there's one with your slides, yes. and then there's one with nothing, and there's no clicker. So this one should be the one with my slides, but your slides should not be on the one with my slides. Oh, oh this is it? Okay. Yeah. Okay, good. Thank you. <laughs> All right, so you get longer to look at this picture here, which is uh, the, the point of which is just to uh, first give credit to my co-authors on the project, and also to show that this, this is a sort of heavy industrial um, activity. Okay, so green button. Yes, yes. All right. So, um, as Alessandra said, there is a large literature to which I've contributed talking about negative health effects of polluting industries. Uh, so, that's an important aspect of this type of policy. Uh, there's still a lot of uncertainty about the exact magnitudes of the effects, and so there's controversy about that. And on the other side, we know that these kinds of industries do bring jobs, uh, create higher property values, and there could be spillover effects of that onto other industries in the local area. So there's definitely pros and cons. And so in this study, what we try and do is look at the local costs and benefits of fracking, um, which you can think of as a, a new industry coming into poor, largely rural locations. 
bringing royalty payments as well as a lot of economic activity, uh, but also a lot of concerns about pollution, congestion, also crime, when you bring a whole lot of young men into an area that sometimes happens. Um, and there's been a lot of heterogeneity in how communities have reacted. So, for example, Pennsylvania embraced fracking, um, you know, let all kinds of companies come in very early. New York, which is um, in the same Marcellus shale, banned fracking, right? So uh, there's a lot of division about whether to allow it or not. Uh, and then also at the international level, some countries have uh, gone in for fracking and other ones have banned it. Okay. So just to show that this is a new industry, this graph is showing at the top uh, hydrocarbons from conventional sources, which have turned down slightly after 2005, and then um, fracking, which is the line at the bottom, which you know basically didn't really exist until 2005. So it's just in the last um, 12 years or so that we see this. It's difficult to identify the effects of fracking, though, because there are a lot of differences between the communities that uh, have embraced fracking and the, the ones that haven't. So in this paper, what we do is to try and use the underlying geology of the area to predict which areas are going to get fracking. Uh, so we purchased from Reistead Energy, which is an oil and gas consulting company, an index that they used to say, which area of this shale basin has the best quality resources. So that would be the sort of thing that a company would buy when they're trying to think about where they should put one of these wells. And then we also, of course, have differences in the timing at which the uh, deposits were exploited. So this map is showing the different shale basins in the United States. Those are in green. So a basin is just like it sounds, a geological formation that forms sort of a basin. And then the sediments fall into the center of the basin and eventually turn into uh, oil and gas. So uh, within these basins, you have what are called plays, which could be at different levels. Okay? And the, within the play, then you have uh, areas that are considered to be better prospects than others, so different quality of resources within the play. So here the green is the basin, the blue, blue is the play, and the red are the areas that are supposed to be the really hot uh, prospects. Okay, so we take this index uh, and take that map and then break it up into counties to say which counties are the ones that are the most likely to benefit. And when we do that, we look at the maximum score in each county, and the idea being that, uh, and empirically it turns out to be the case, that whether or not you see fracking in an area depends more on what's the maximum value than on what's the average value in the area. So. Uh, Putting this into counties looks something like this. And essentially what we're going to be doing is comparing the red counties to the blue counties within the same play. Okay. And that's actually quite different than what a lot of the previous research on this has done, which was to say, let's compare a place that has fracking to another rural place, but not necessarily in the same play. And what I'll show you in a minute is that those places, um, the prospective comparison places, are often quite different. Uh, so the way that we've done it, arguably, we're getting a more similar comparison. Uh, an exception to that is listed here at the end, where they're comparing border areas in Pennsylvania to border areas in New York. Um, so that's arguably a, a better comparison, although you know, that's just for one particular play, and we're going to do it for all of them. And uh, as I mentioned, one of the findings is going to be that there's a lot of heterogeneity in the effects. Okay, so this is looking at uh, 
Um, first of all, what are the shale plays? That's the first column. Or, yeah, the first column is the plays. The second column is the basins. Then we have the year when they first had fracturing. Uh, in a lot of the results I'm going to show you, we're focusing on ones that had fracturing in 2008 or earlier, just so that we have some years before and some years afterwards. And then you can see how many counties we have in the treatment group and how many counties we have in the control group for each one. The outcomes that we have, we're basically trying to look at all the outcomes that we can to get more of a complete picture about what's going on here. So we look at employment and annual earnings, uh, wages by industry, the housing price index, also housing starts, housing units, uh, housing permits for new construction. Um, everything is indexed to $2010, and we can also look at migration. Uh, we look at crime. We look at local government spending and revenues, which I think is actually pretty interesting. And then because we can get school district level enrollments, we can look at school expenditures on a per student basis to get some idea about where the revenue that comes in is going. Uh, actually, we don't look at health in this paper, um, but I'll show you a little bit at the end some, some results on health. Okay, so I'm glad they have a really big screen here because the font is small. But uh, the purpose of this table is to try and validate the comparison group that we're using. So in the first column, you see what happens if we compare counties that are in the basins to counties that are in the rest of the US. And those counties are very different. Right? So they have lower home values. They have lower employment. They have uh, less educated populations. It's kind of what you would expect when you're thinking about um, you know, fracking in, in North Dakota. If we look within a basin, and compare the play to the other counties in the same basin, then it, it looks better, although there's still some statistically significant differences. And then if we look at the counties within the play that look like they're the best prospects for fracking compared to the other counties that are also over a, shale, you know, over a gas deposit, um, that looks a lot better. So this is looking at levels. We can also look at trends. Um, and the same thing if we look at trends, our comparison, there's a few things that are statistically significantly different, um, largely that the share with a bachelor's degree or more was going up in the places that had the top, um, top rice dead quartiles compared to the other places in the same play. But uh, on the other characteristics, it looks like both the levels and the trends were pretty similar in the treatment group and the control group. Okay. So we're going to estimate models where we uh, put in a control for the play and the year. Okay. So we're looking within plays. We also put in a fixed effect for the county. And then our sort of key thing that we're going to be looking at is the interaction between is this after fracking started or before fracking started? And is this a place that had the, was in the top uh, Rystead quartile, that is one of the best places to do fracking? Okay. And so if you look at this in an event study framework, the first thing you want to see is that, well, something actually did happen. Um, in these places, they produced a lot of hydrocarbons. Um, so by the by four years out, they're producing $400 million worth of hydrocarbons. Um, we can look at that in a, a number of different specifications. Um, so what you saw was the first column. Uh, the second column here is putting in some additional trends. The third column is putting in um, even more trends and also looking at a more restricted group of counties. So that's just looking at the ones that had production uh, in the play before 2008. But you still see increases in um, production in all of those places. If we look at employment, you also see large increases in employment. Uh, so by 
four years after the start of fracking, it's uh, a little bit over 5% increase in employment. Okay. If we look at income, you see increases in income. Okay. Now, if we break down the increases in income into its components, you can see that a lot of this is coming from wage and salary income. Some of it is coming from rents. So if you're a landlord, you do really well in these areas. You don't see any effect on transfers, and you don't see any effect on proprietor's income. So some, some of the spillovers, maybe onto other businesses that you might have expected, um, don't seem to be significant. You can look by industry, and you see a fairly consistent pattern. So uh, obviously, the biggest increase in employment is in natural resources and mining, also construction, some in trade and transportation. And then none of the other sectors show statistically significant changes. Uh, I should also point out that the overall change is bigger here than in the regressions I just showed you because it's using a different data source. And here, we're, uh, this data source counts uh, jobs no matter where people live, whereas the ones I showed you earlier were only counting jobs for people in the county. Okay, so what that difference is showing you is that a lot of the people who come to work at the fracking location consider their residents to be in a different location. Looking at migration, then, you can see, um, well, in two out of three of our specifications, we're getting significant in-migration, um, not too much on out-migration. Okay, so you're seeing a picture of people coming into work, lots of jobs. They don't necessarily locate in the place where they're coming to. If we look at local expenditures, you have an increase in operating expenditures, no significant change in capital outlays. And then breaking down the expenditures by purpose, you see a big increase in expenditures for public safety. Okay? So that would be consistent with maybe having an uh, increase in crime or potential crime. You don't see any significant effect on uh, welfare expenditures or hospital expenditures. You see some increase in infrastructure and utility expenditures uh, and you know, a sort of marginal effect on other expenditures. Okay. If we look at, I have a feeling that I cut off the, oh no, education expenditures, you're also not seeing any effect. So I just want to highlight that. So they're getting a bunch of money, which I'll talk about in a minute, and then they're spending the money on infrastructure to support the fracking and on um, uh, law enforcement. Okay. But it's not spilling over on the hospitals and the schools. If you look at where the money's coming from, it's coming from sales tax revenues and um, a little bit from other revenues uh, and from property tax revenues. Okay. You see an increase in housing values. Uh, I thought, interestingly, you also see a, an increase in mobile housing units. So some of the people are going to be housed in, in temporary type of housing. You see some increase in rental prices uh, and no change, um, and this is four years afterwards, in total housing units. Right? So that's why I guess some of the people are living in the, uh, in the um, mobile housing units. If we look at crime, here we see some effect in the first two specifications on violent crime. Uh, although it's not robust to putting in the county trend and looking at the smaller sample. Okay. Uh, another thing we can do here is to look at this play-by-play, -play, and then we end up with smaller sample sizes for each one. Um, so not everything is statistically significant. But I think the most striking thing here is how heterogeneous the effects are. So, you know, different places end up producing uh, gas of vastly different values, creating different numbers of jobs. 
Um, some of the places have increases in housing prices. Some of them don't. Um, and if we try and look at this graphically, you're not going to be able to see any of the labels, but I just want to show the pattern. So this is looking at county level employment. Up at the top right is the Bakken, which was one of the places that had the biggest increase in hydrocarbons. So that's kind of the success story, if you like, in that they get the big increase in production, which is, an which is accompanied by a big increase in employment. Some of the other places, uh, like the, the Marcellus, which is uh, four down on your left there, you don't see any increase in employment. So I think that's an important thing to take away. If we look at crime, it's actually kind of similar in the sense that some places seem to show increases in crime. Other places, you don't really see anything. It's quite noisy uh, across these different plays. One of the things we do in the paper is try and come up with a welfare calculation. And the idea behind that is to assume that if the marginal resident has to be indifferent between being in the place with the fracking and being somewhere else, then local housing prices are going to have to respond to both the increase in economic activity and the change in amenities. So if you're willing to make that assumption, um, then you can use the estimates from the literature on the relationship between productivity shocks and house prices to back out what is the value of the changes in amenities and the total change in welfare. So we do that under a, a range of different assumptions. We have to make an assumption about the uh, share of household income that's spent on housing and also the value of moving costs or idiosyncratic preferences for that particular location. Um, and so our preferred estimates are in the top row here. And I'm showing this for two different housing cost increases. Right? And so since the assumption here is that everything is capitalized into housing values, the housing value that you have uh, is going to drive the welfare calculations. If you have a bigger change in housing costs, that is interpreted as a bigger uh, increase in welfare. Okay. So we're getting here, uh, you know, on the order of $1,000 to $2,000 per household as a welfare benefit per year. Okay. So overall, then, the um, findings are that these counties experienced very large gains in income, employment, and wages. The local governments saw an increase in revenues, also an increase in expenditures. Um, so that looks really good. I think if you break it down into what they're spending the money on, that gives you some pause to realize that they're mostly spending it to support the new industry and also the, the uh, crime that it may be bringing in. You also see a higher violent crime rate, although those are a bit noisy, and this 20% increase in public safety expenditures, which is pretty large. Overall, we estimate that the welfare among households that were living in this community goes up by about $1,000 to $2,000 annually. But there's also substantial uh, heterogeneity across plays and we think it's important to remember that there's going to be heterogeneity within place as well. So even if you get a positive mean increase in welfare, which is what we're talking about, fracking could still not make the majority of residents better off. So clearly individuals who aren't in the labor force aren't going to benefit from higher wages. Renters who aren't in the labor force are going to do particularly poorly, say the elderly, because they're going to face higher rents and they're not getting any of the benefits. Homeowners who don't own mineral rights may also not do so well relative to ones that do. And uh, another thing I want to flag is that people have very imperfect information about pollution, which is what I mentioned at the beginning. The housing values are based on this idea that all the disamenities are capitalized into housing prices. But if you don't know about the disamenity, then 
how can that be capitalized into the housing price? So what that means is that if people learn more, then uh, you expect the increase in housing prices to be lessened. And so the um, estimates of what the welfare effects are, are are pretty sensitive to that and could change uh, fairly dramatically with new information. So. Uh, one of the things we take away from this is that resolution of this uncertainty about the effects of pollution is actually quite important if you're, trying to, if you're expecting a market mechanism to work to value the amenities and disamenities correctly. Another thing I want to flag, and, and this is bringing in some uh, results from some other work, is that uh, one of the sort of unknowns is how far away do you have to be from the fracking before you're not affected by the pollution. And so in some work uh, that I did with Michael Greenstone and Catherine Meckel, we estimated that the effects of pollution on infant health, which I think here you should just take as a marker for whether we can detect health effects at different distances, were detectable at residences that were less than two kilometers away from a fracking site, but we could not detect them uh, at distances further away. So you can see in the picture here, there's kind of a, sh a sharp drop off. It looks like around 1.5 kilometers and then no statistically significant effect after that. And the reason why I think that's important is because to make local policy sensibly about fracking, uh, but also about polluting industries more generally, might require information about this sort of thing. Right? How far do you have to be away from the pollution source for it not to have a health effect? Um, and so one way to support sensible place-based policies would be to make that kind of information available or to make getting that kind of information um, a priority. Also, given these heterogeneous effects within place that you have winners and losers, policies to somehow share the wealth might also uh, be necessary in order for this to be welfare improving for the majority of the residents. And I think that's it. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So we'll move to our second speaker, Nathan Hendren from Harvard. <laughs> oh, I do need that clicker, yeah, for the discussion. Sorry about that, Janet. Okay. Is that going to be uh, in progress? All right. Let me just make sure before we go, we can go. All right. Cool. Um, so thanks for the invitation to, uh, to be on the panel here. Um, so today I'm going to talk about the Opportunity Atlas, uh, mapping the childhood roots of social mobility. This is uh, joint work with Raj Chetty at Harvard, John Friedman at Brown, and also Maggie Jones and Sonia Porter at the US Census Bureau, and I'm uh, Nathan Hendren. So we're motivated in this project by the growing body of evidence that it matters where you grow up. Neighborhoods have substantial causal effects on ch children's outcomes in adulthood. And this raises the natural question, where are the places in the US that provide the best opportunities for our kids to rise up in the income distribution. Previous work has often focused on a smaller set of neighborhoods, things like the moving to opportunity experiment, or taking a look at broader geographies, things like counties and commuting zones. And what we're gonna do in this work is construct publicly available estimates of children's earnings in adulthood and other long run outcomes separately for kids based on different parental income backgrounds, kids of different races, and kids of different genders, for every census tract in the US. So this is about 70,000 census tracts, about 4,000 people in each tract. And the key difference of what we're doing with this, these statistics, so there's a lot of census statistics out there by tract level, the key difference here is that we're gonna be mapping the outcomes we see today, things like poverty and incarceration,
that are occurring today back to where children grew up and think about the childhood locations of where those outcomes were starting. And so there's a large literature uh, looking at the impacts of place-based policies, looking at the role of local labor markets in shaping and documenting the importance of these things for production, so how the economy is, uh, is operating. But here what we're going to do is focus on the role of place in producing outcomes in the next generation. And so just to give you a sense of the, the data, we're going to be using census data from the 2000 and 2010 decennial census along with the American Community Survey covering the U.S. population. And this data is going to be linked to federal income tax returns spanning 1989 to 2015. And we're going to be linking each child to their parents based on dependent claiming on t tax forms in the tax data. Now our target sample for what I'll show you today is going to be all kids born between the 1978 and 1983 birth cohorts who were either born in the U.S. or authorized immigrants who came to the U.S. during their childhood. Now this uh, leads us, when we approximate that target sample with our data, leads us to an analysis sample of about 20.5 million kids, which we estimate to be about 96% of the target sample. So you can't link every child to their parents in the tax data, but you get, uh, get pretty close. Now, I said we're going to construct estimates separately for kids of different parental income backgrounds. When I talk about parental income background, I'm going to be referring to parents' pre-tax household incomes, which is going to be defined as the mean adjusted gross income taken from 1994 to 2000, so an average across those years. And for people that didn't file in those years where they don't file, we're going to assume zero incomes. Now for kids, we're going to take their average income today, so the last two years of our data, taking an average over 2014 and 2015, uh, again using pre-tax household income. So this is when kids are about in their mid-30s or so. And for children, we also can link up for people that aren't filing taxes. We have information returns like W-2s that allows us to impute their incomes as well. Now, one of the uh, kind of potential concerns with focusing on earnings at, say, age 35 is that that's not necessarily a measure of lifetime income. Um, however, we're going to exploit some results uh, in our earlier work that shows how you can mitigate life cycle bias by focusing on percentile ranks in the national income distribution. And so when I talk about percentile ranks, what I'm going to think about is, uh, for example, I was born in 1982. We're going to rank me from a, on a scale of 0 to 100 relative to every other child who was also born in 1982 in the US and assign me that number and do that for all the other kids in their birth cohorts. And then for parents, we're going to take my parents and all the other parents of children born in 1982 and rank them on a scale from 0 to 100 again. And so when we do this uh, at the national level, just pooling all the data, uh, we can look at the, the following pattern where on the horizontal axis you have the average child income, uh, average parent income rank from 0 to 100 with in parentheses you're seeing what incomes that actually corresponds to. And on the vertical axis, you see the average child income rank as a function of their parents' income. So this is just taking each of those bins and computing the average child income rank. And so you can see this increasing pattern. Now, I'm going to focus on how these patterns vary separately across the US. And to start off with that, I'm going to fix a particular level of parental income at the 25th percentile. So thinking about below median income households. Now. <clears throat> In the uh, national data, on average, a child born at the 25th percentile would grow up to reach about the 41st percentile of the national income distribution within their birth cohort. And so what does this correspond to? Well, in your mid-30s, that corresponds to about $31,900. Uh, $900. So uh, we're going to be doing all the mechanics with these uh, ranks going on in, uh, behind the scenes. But for ease of interpretation, we're going to interpret the rank units in terms of the dollar value it corresponds to. All right. Now, not all the patterns we're going to take a look at are going to be so nicely linear. Uh, here's the pattern for uh, the fraction of uh, black males that were incarcerated on April 1st, 2010. So this is a single day, uh, the day of the 2010 census. And what you can see is that uh, black males whose parents were at the bottom of the income distribution 20% of them were incarcerated on April 1st, 2010, and that falls to about 
uh, at the top, even kids who were born to parents uh, uh, making more than uh, $800,000 a year. Now, again, we're going to be focusing not just, this was a focus of some of our earlier work. What we're going to now be asking is how do these patterns vary separately based on the neighborhoods in which kids grew up. Now, I want to motivate this focus on neighborhoods through two potential uh, applications that we see for the data that we are constructing. The first is a, an observational variation and targeting example which we're going to use to motivate just focusing on the observed outcomes of these children in the data. So not thinking about whether or not the spatial variation reflects a causal effect or not, just asking uh, where are kids doing, uh, doing quote unquote, doing well. The second is going to be thinking about a neighborhood choice uh, application. And there we're going to really have to take seriously the question of whether or not the variation we're looking at reflects the causal effects of those places or perhaps a selection of different types of families into different places. And so to go through these in turn, I'm going to start off with the observational variation and targeting. And we're motivated here by the fact that many policies target areas based on characteristics like poverty rates at the tract level. So you can think of things like tax policies, like the recent construction of opportunity zones. You can think of the provision of local services, like Head Start programs. Um, and for these applications, the observed outcomes are of direct interest from an optimal tax perspective. If you think of using location as a tag to find the children who have the lowest chances of rising up in the income distribution, that's where this type of statistic is going to prove quite useful. So just motivated by this application, <clears throat> we're going to focus a little bit here uh, for just looking at the observed outcomes across places. Now to do that, I'm actually going to flip over to an interactive web tool that we've put together at opportunityatlas.org that allows, uh, this is publicly available on the web, and allows people to uh, uh, browse the uh, data that we have put together. And what you're looking at here is the broad national patterns across the US uh, that we have uh, uh, already noted in some of our earlier work. And then what you can see is there's a lot of variation in the average incomes of kids growing up in these different neighborhoods, so, or different regions of the country. So children growing up, uh, we can start here up in Minneapolis. On average, kids who grew up in below median income families, so kids at the, whose parents were at the 25th percentile, on average, they grew up to earn about $37,000 a year. Uh, now, in the south, portions of the, uh, the Rust Belt, those incomes were a little bit lower, so up in the uh, regions of, say, $27,000 here in Atlanta, Georgia. And so this, again, I think is a nice example that highlights the distinction of our statistics relative to focusing on where production takes place. So Atlanta is a very booming economy, right? Um, but the average incomes of kids who are growing up in Atlanta uh, are, are not, uh, uh, not as high as some other areas. Okay. So now we can zoom in, and so I was saying that Minneapolis has $37,000 a year on average for kids in low-income families, so we can, uh, as long as this works, and I'll cross my fingers that the internet's going to hold out for us here, uh, we can zoom into Minneapolis and see how that $37,000 a year varies across neighborhoods within the Minneapolis area. And so this is where I really cross those fingers. <laughs> we plugged in the internet, so we'll see if it works. Uh, this is slower than I would have liked, but uh, <laughs> there we go. All right, so now we're zoomed in uh, to Minneapolis. And the first thing I want you to, to note here, um, so the scaling is the same. So what you're looking at here are variations in colors that correspond to the same type of variation we were looking at at a national level. And for kids in low-income families that, say, grew up in North Minneapolis, we're seeing average incomes uh, kind of in the neighborhood of where, what you were seeing for kids that grew up on average in Atlanta, uh, in the kind of $25,000 re uh, region, uh, down in the $23,000 region for South Minneapolis, similar outcomes over in St. Paul. But if you go out into some of the suburbs, you know, you can pick some places of Maple Grove where low-income kids are growing up to earn $49,000 a year, much higher than what we saw uh, in a lot of places across the country on average. All right. So not only can we construct estimates separately, uh, separately by census tract for pooling all children in low-income families, we can also see how these patterns vary across races. So this is showing you uh, outcomes for uh, low-income white children. Um, and so you can see here a lot of, the, uh, a lot of variation even within uh, race, so to speak. So some of our earlier work has documented that in every census tract in the US, 
low-income uh, white children have lower, grow up to have lower incomes than low-income black children, or higher incomes than low-income black children. And so that's going to become apparent as I scroll through some of these patterns here. So in North Minneapolis, uh, we're seeing slightly higher incomes, closer to $30,000 a year for low-income white children. I'll show you black children in a second. Um, and then if we go up to those the same tract uh, up in Maple Grove, you're up around $56,000 a year instead of uh, $49,000 a year. So you can see some of these patterns uh, varying across uh, across tracks and just enormous degrees of variation even at these, these finer levels of geography. So we can now switch over to black children. And what you can see is that a lot of the tracks uh, went away. So we can't report statistics for samples smaller than 20. And so you hit the cell size restriction because of the fact of racial segregation uh, in the US. This is not a common or not an uh, uncommon thing in, in US cities, of course. And so if we zoom in here a little bit more, you can see some of the, uh, some of the patterns. So again, now the incomes of low-income black children are slightly lower than what we were seeing for low-income white children in these neighborhoods. Um, but if we go back, and I'm just going to scroll it up here, you know, if we go back and compare across some of these different neighborhoods up in Maple Grove and Brooklyn Park, you see incomes and you see places where low-income black children are growing up to earn $40,000 a year, which is much higher than what we were seeing for low-income white children growing up in North Minneapolis, for example. And so there's enormous racial differences in upward mobility across uh, areas and on average in the U.S., but what I hope this highlights is that even at these fine levels of geography, you see enormous differences across neighborhoods uh, here, in, uh, here in the Minneapolis area. And so I picked Minneapolis, obviously, because we're here uh, in Minneapolis. You can do, a, uh, do more, uh, more locations, and I'm happy to do that uh, later on in the, the question and answer session. So just to return now to the talk, and since the internet worked, I'll skip through the other example that we could have talked through had it not. Um, what I want to do now is zoom back uh, zoom back out and think about on the map uh, across census tracts of the U.S. What are the characteristics of places that tend to have higher rates of upward mobility for low-income kids? And so what I'm going to show you here is the correlation of upward mobility for, uh, uh, for low-income kids where we're going to take the correlation separately for each uh, race group and then average using the national uh, uh, using the national race uh, uh, national race uh, using the racial shares uh, to get a race adjusted measure. And what we're going to see here in the first three columns, or sorry, first three rows, um, is a lack of a correlation with the fraction uh, with the measures of job availability. So things like the number of jobs within five miles, number of high paying jobs within five miles, job growth. We don't find strong correlations with kind of the strength of the very local labor market in that tract. Uh, but what we do see is a stronger correlation with the fraction of people in your neighborhood while you are growing up that also have jobs. And so if you're growing up in an environment where people are working, those tend to be places where children have higher rates of upward mobility. Now, we also see strong correlations with kind of traditional measures of quote unquote neighborhood quality. So measures like the share above the poverty line, measures of mean household income, the uh, third grade test scores, for example, and the fraction of residents that have a college degree. Now, one of the questions that you might ask when thinking about these traditional measures of good neighborhoods is sort of at what level of geography do these correlations live? And by that, what I mean is if we, here we're showing the correlation of the fraction of the uh, poverty rate in your own tract with the upward mobility of your tract, you can also ask conditional on the poverty rate of your own tract, how does this vary if you then go look and, and think about the poverty rates of your neighboring tracts as well? And so we can show you that pattern from a multivariate regression of upward mobility on these different, uh, on the uh, poverty rate in your own tract and all the neighboring tracts in this multivariate regression. And what you can see is that conditional on your own tract, the poverty rates in the neighboring tracks don't have very much predictive power. If you sum up all of those coefficients, it looks like two-thirds of the correlation is driven by your own po uh, poverty rate in your own tract, and about another third is driven by the remaining uh, poverty rates in the neighboring, uh, the neighboring tracks. Now, this is something you can do with the publicly available data that we have constructed. Inside, uh, we can go down to the block level and try to really unpack that zero and really try to understand what, uh, at what level does this decay actually 
uh, occur. And so this is now repeating that same analysis at the census block level. So this is an, a, a tremendously fine-grained uh, measure. And what you can see here is the decay is quite quick. So even within about a half mile radius, conditional on the poverty rates of the blocks within a half mile of your house, the poverty rates of the blocks that are further out are not correlated with your upward mobility. That's what this is showing you. So if you want to think about this type of a perspective on how big is a neighborhood, we have an answer of about a half mile radius. We can also look at a couple other measures of uh, correlates of upward mobility that we focused on in some of our earlier work. So this is looking at the fraction of children um, who grow up in single parent households in the neighborhood, and we find a strong negative correlation. The important thing to note here is that this is not about just growing up in a single versus two parent household. This is about growing up in a neighborhood where more children are growing up in single versus two parent households. Um, so this holds true even if you were to restrict uh, to children in single parent households or within two parent households themselves. We also find strong correlations with measures of social capital. So one proxy for social capital that you can construct at the census tract level is the fraction of people that return their census forms. So sort of a clever measure of kind of civic engagement and, and social capital that people have used uh, in other literature and you find a positive uh, correlation with those variables. We also find correlations with demographic uh, variables, like the fraction black and the fraction Hispanic. Um, so what this is, is telling you is that black and Hispanic children are on average growing up in places that tend to have lower rates of upward mobility for children in all races. So this is again a race adjusted measure of this correlation. Now, we can pool all of these different covariates and ask how much of the variation on the map is explained by these characteristics. And the answer is about half. So half of the variation we can really get to be explained by observable characteristics. The other half is not explained by, uh, by the observable characteristics. And so in this sense, these statistics that we have constructed contain new information that is not immediately captured in the census tract variables that uh, are readily available at the time. But one kind of thing that all of this really masks is the idea that these correlations in and of themselves are actually quite heterogeneous in some cases across places. So our favorite example of this is measures of population density. On average, cities have lower rates of upward mobility than do rural areas. But this is not always uh, the case. So here you are seeing that cities in North Carolina tend to have higher rates of upward mobility than cities, uh, uh, sorry, than rural areas in North Carolina. Rural areas have lower rates of upward mobility, and this is upward mobility just uh, for white children here in North, Carol uh, in North Carolina. The opposite pattern happens in Iowa. Uh, so in Iowa, uh, white children have lower rate rates of upward mobility in cities like Des Moines and Cedar Rapids than they do in the surrounding rural areas. And so this just highlights the heterogeneity in the correlations that you can see when you have this, uh, this kind of rich data and we're kind of excited about the different patterns. You know, this is one thing we've been able to uncover, um, but by no means have we scratched the surface on the uh, types of heterogeneity and differential gradients that you might see across the US. And so lastly, uh, when it comes to think about, thinking about targeting resources or actually thinking about targeting like a Head Start program based on this data, things start to get a little bit more scary in the sense that it is important to note that this data is constructed for kids born in the 1978 to 83 birth cohort, right? And so we measure their outcomes today, but they were growing up in those neighborhoods 15 years ago. And so a key question is to what extent are these patterns stable over time? And so we'll obviously be able to answer that in much greater detail as we get more data and are able to look over, uh, over time. But what we can do in our data is two things that makes us reasonably reassured that there is a considerable amount of stability in the estimates, that they provide additional information and not available uh, uh, in current statistics. So the first is that if you look at slightly earlier ages, so in particular if you take child's incomes at age 26 instead of their 30s, and look at how those patterns vary over time, say between the 1980 and the 1990 birth cohort, you actually see pretty strong signal correlations across cohorts. You get a decay going down to about 90%, uh, uh, about a 10% decay after about 10 years. So there's pretty, uh, pretty decent persistence over time. Um, the second is that you can try to, uh, try to predict 
the outcomes in the, say, the 1990 cohort using both the 1980 cohort and a vector of observable census characteristics that have been realized post-19, uh, uh, what would be relevant for the 1980 cohort and would arguably be more relevant for the 1990 cohort. And when you do those regressions, you see that the lagged upward mobility characteristics are significantly more predictive. So something like 80 versus 20% of the predictive content is really in the lagged mobility characteristics as opposed to the uh, newly realized census characteristics. And so this is all goes to say, it would be crazy to say that places aren't changing. But I think there's considerable persistence that in all cases where we've actually uh, really dove in and taken a look, we've been surprised by how stable these estimates are over time. Okay, so that's the uh, observational variation and targeting example. Now I want to turn to a causal effect and neighborhood choice example, motivated by the uh, idea and the question of where should a family seek, seeking to improve their children's outcomes uh, choose to live. Um, this is an answer that you know, might matter both to an individual family, um, but also has important uh, implications for policy design. A lot of affordable housing programs, things like housing choice vouchers, have ex the explicit goal of helping low-income families access higher opportunity neighborhoods. And they currently define higher opportunity neighborhoods using things like mean incomes in the area, or the poverty rate, or other measures of demographics. And so for these questions, if we want to think about using the map to address those types of questions, it is absolutely critical to understand how much of the variation on that map reflects the causal effect those neighborhoods are having on kids. And so that's what I want to first turn to here. And we're going to address this using two different research designs. The first is going to be to exploit variation in where children grow up from the moving to opportunity experiment. So this is based on some earlier work that we've done, uh, but we're going to compare observational predictions that you would expect based on the maps that I've shown you to what we actually see based on where uh, kids grew up in the moving to opportunity experiment and exploit that exogenous variation. The second is to build on some work that Raj and I have done uh, using a movers quasi-experimental design that exploits the experiences of all children who moved across different tracks during their childhood and uses a, a, an exposure time designed to understand the causal effects of those neighborhoods. So I'll walk through these in turn. Moving to opportunity experiment uh, started with children growing up in uh, high poverty census tracts in Chicago. So these are public housing projects in, in Chicago. And there were two additional groups. So there was a Section 8 group that got access to these Section 8 vouchers uh, that could use those vouchers to move uh, into any location that would accept them. And there was another group, excuse me, the experimental group, uh, that got a Section 8 voucher but had to use it in a lower poverty uh, census tract. And so you can ask where on average, to, what are the common places where these people chose to move? So this is just showing you those, uh, those locations on the map, overlaying our own estimates from the, uh, uh, from the uh, Opportunity Atlas. And so now what we can do is we can take the predictions based on where kids actually ended up choosing to, uh, to go in these three different groups. So whether you were in one of those three groups was randomly assigned based on the experiment. And we can say, what would you have expected to see happen to these different kids uh, based on the uh, patterns that you see on the map here? And what I'm doing on the horizontal axis is plotting the average incomes in those, uh, of kids in those different tracks that you would expect based on the atlas. And on the vertical axis, plotting what you actually see in the MTO data for these different kids. And so comparing the treatment effects that you see in the MTO data to what you would have expected based on the maps. And so this is just for one of the sites in Chicago. We can add in the other four sites uh, onto the map. And so these are smaller, uh, smaller samples. So there's considerable sampling uncertainty going on around the estimates. But when you pool all the estimates together and run the regression, you get a coefficient of 0.7 with a uh, standard error of about 0.25. So you're sitting with a t-stat of about 2.5 to 3, suggesting that about 70% of the variation that you see on the map reflects the causal effects of place picked up by children who moved when they were young kids. So just I, I should have made this per, uh, clear. So the sample that is moving across these different neighborhoods are children aged zero Zero to, uh, aged 1 to 12. All right. And so this suggests that the majority of the variation is being picked up by kids who were experimentally moved into different locations uh, across these five cities. Now this is just one uh, example of, uh, of people moving. Um, we want to now try to extend this approach looking at the experiences of kids who grew up in uh, different neighborhoods by exploiting a research design that can be applied to all census tracts in the US. And so here I'm going to follow a design that Raj and I developed in some recent work. Um, and I won't have time to go into the, uh, into the details, but let me walk you through the intuition of the following figure. So 
I want you to imagine that you have a, a, a child that is moving between and, and deciding to live either in a uh, lighter, uh, like a bluer colored uh, census tract on that map or a redder colored census tract on that map. And imagine that we compare the outcomes of the child who moves to the blue, uh, bluer colored census tract relative to the redder colored census tract. And so think about that comparison as the difference between the bluer track on the t uh, going to the top of the axis and the red track on the bottom of the axis. And now let's do that separately for kids who move at different ages during childhood. And what you see is that the earlier the kids move to the blue versus the red census tract, you see that their outcomes are higher. Uh, concretely, you look, uh, another way to say this is that if you move at age, say, three, you look like 90% of the place where you go as opposed to, say, 10% of where you came from. If you move at age, say, 23, you look like 30% of where you go about 70% of where you came from. And so what this uh, suggests is that the earlier you move to a better neighborhood, the better your outcomes are in adulthood. And every year of childhood exposure seems to matter with a rate of about 2.5%. Now, there's a lot of potential concerns with interpreting that 2.5% as a causal effect, right? Um, the key concern might be that maybe good parents go to good neighborhoods disproportionately when their children are young. And so one of the things we can do to take a look at that potential concern is to drop in family fixed effects, motivated by a lot of uh, research designs that have uh, been done in, in existing work by Janet and others. And what we can see is that if you compare the outcomes, uh, let me walk you through the example. Suppose you, uh, you take two families. One has a fourth and a fifth grader. The other has a third and a sixth grader. What you can see is that on average, the difference in the kids' outcomes between the third and the sixth grader is larger than the difference in the outcomes than the, between the fourth and the fifth grader by a factor of about three in proportion to the uh, difference that you would see on the map. So the, uh, basically, you can replicate that exposure design with family fixed effects where you identify off the age gap between the siblings. The second thing we can do is to uh, do the, what we call these outcome-based placebo tests that exploits heterogeneity in place effects uh, by gender, income, uh, outcome and uh, uh, income, parental income quantile. What we see here is that the easiest way to sum this up is that we look like a weighted average of where we grew up on a whole range of different outcomes. So on all the outcomes that we see on that map, if we imagine that you grew up in two different places, you look like a weighted average of those two places with the weights proportional to how long you spent growing up in those different, uh, those different neighborhoods. And that's true for all different ranges of outcomes. And it's also true if you condition on one outcome and you consider movers that moved uh, uh, outcomes who, uh, uh, you know, so one way to say this, if you move, if you have a boy and a girl in a family and you move to a place where boys are doing well and girls are not doing well, on average, your boy will have a higher income in adulthood, your girl will not, in proportion to how long they spend growing up in those neighborhoods. Right? So that's another result that we can see in the data. Lastly, I want to talk about how this all relates to prices. So we estimate that moving at birth from a below median tract to an above median tract can cause your child's income to, have, uh, to be $200,000 larger in adulthood. So substantial effects uh, on what you might think of as uh, you know, substantial benefits for these kids. And so the question is, you know, why aren't more families making these moves, perhaps? One natural uh, rationale is that good neighborhoods are more expensive. Right? Uh, and so the feasibility of those types of moves depends on being able to find affordable housing. And so we can think about how this relates to housing prices. And the answer is good neighborhoods are on average more expensive. Here's Chicago. On average, places that have higher upward mobility tend to have higher prices. But there's enormous variation conditional on prices. And so you can think about these kind of uh, places as potential opportunity bargains. Uh, are they places that have the same rent uh, but some have higher rates of upward, uh, upward mobility. So you don't always have to pay more to find better uh, opportunities for your kids. And so what might explain these types of patterns? Uh, you know, how could these exist in spatial equilibrium? They could have other disamenities, of course. They may not be good places to grow up. However, it doesn't look like they uh, have longer commutes necessarily, but there could be other disamenities. Alternative uh, explanation is maybe there's lack of information or other barriers like discrimination. And so a really a key question that we're motivated with going forward is if we think about relaxing the barriers that families might face but to moving to higher opportunity neighborhoods, will they choose to move there? And so we're currently in the field 
with a RCT in Seattle to ask exactly this question. Provide families with financial assistance, with search assistance in particular, that's the largest component of this, uh, of this experiment, to really understand if you show families these neighborhoods, are they interested in actually moving there? Uh, and so try to understand and unpack the constraints that families might face when thinking about moving to a better neighborhood for their kids. Um, so I'm over time, so I will stop there, but thanks for, uh, thanks for the opportunity. Thank you very much. David Author from MIT. You, you will not want my clicker. You probably want this one. He's our next speaker. And here is the they clicker. They had mine on the internet, and the other one was not. Thank you. Sure. Great. Everybody. Um, this is, uh, so thanks very much. Delighted to be at this conference. Uh, thank you to the Opportunity Inclusive Growth Initiative for hosting us here. Um, the, uh, I, this is I'm presenting joint work with uh, David Dorn of the University of Zurich and with Gordon Hansen of UC San Diego. And this is very closely related uh, to both branch, both papers were just presented, but I think especially so to uh, the work that Nathan presented in that we're looking at shocks to conditions in a local area, not as small, uh, and asking about what are their consequences uh, at several levels. One on employment, another on earnings, the uh, a third on the function of adults, what they actually do with their time, uh, and fourth on how this affects household formation and children's exposure to different environments. Um, so the title of our paper comes from William Julius Wilson's book from 1996, When Work Disappears, uh, at where he makes the argument that a neighborhood in which people are poor but employed is different from a neighborhood in which people are poor and jobless. And he argues that many of today's problems in the inner cities uh, are fundamentally a consequence of the disappearance of work, which actually interestingly also related to the correlation you showed about the fraction of people working as opposed to being of income, the fraction of the average income level as being a strong predictor of children's outcomes. Um, now, when I first introduced this quotation to my co-authors, uh, Gordon said, that's great, but he's talking about blacks in the inner city and we're talking about manufacturing uh, in rural areas and small cities and so on. So then uh, David Dorn went to J.D. Vance, <laughs> who talked about his experience reading William Julius Wilson when he was a boy, and he said, book, Wilson's, Wilson's book spoke to me. I wanted to write him a letter and tell him that he described my home perfectly. That resonated so personally is odd because he, was writing about, he wasn't writing about the hillbilly transplants from Appalachia, which is where Vance is from. He's writing about black people in the inner cities. So uh, I think many would, uh, it's, not, it's not so controversial that many of the issues that Wilson put his finger on earlier, looking at urban African Americans, apply more broadly to less educated adults in the United States uh, at present. So uh, we are interested in the relationship between labor market opportunities and family and children's outcomes. And uh, you know, going back to Becker, um, uh, Becker makes a very strong prediction that uh, a lot of the gains to marriage depend upon specialization. Uh, differences in earnings between men and women uh, will lead one to specialize in market work and another to specialize in non-market work. Uh, and so if, we start, if we're starting from a point where males are primarily specialized in market work, uh, adverse shocks to relative male earnings will tend to reduce marriage, uh, reduce the gains from marriage, and if children are normal good, to reduce fertility. Um, if we go to Wilson, um, Wilson's argument is that the decline of US blue collar jobs has shrunk the pool of economically secure young men, um, which would tend to reduce the gains from marriage. Um, it doesn't make much of a prediction, Wilson doesn't, excuse me, Becker doesn't make much of a prediction either about fertility per se or household formation or children being born out of marriage. Um, but that's an important feature of the data and something we're going to explore. And, uh, and I think that one distinction between uh, Becker and how Wilson sort of extended his ideas, I would say informally, um, is uh, Wilson was focused on this notion of decay, of the a decay of norms, decay of uh, family structures, and so on. And, and that doesn't really exist in just sort of the canonical specialization model, but uh, he felt that the consequences were much broader than simply uh, what you predict based on earnings. And that's what we're going to look for here. So just to give you some context, the, first, the, the, the place where we're going to start from, or the variation we're going to use, is from the shock to US manufacturing. Uh, which was a big shock to US male employment and earnings. So uh, as many of you know, 
uh, there was a dramatic, fairly unprecedented fall in U.S. manufacturing employment uh, after 1999. So it's often people often like to point out, oh, U.S. manufacturing is you know has been contracting since the Second World War, uh, and that's true as a share of all employment. But numerically, actually, U.S. manufacturing grew from uh, the late 1940s all the way to 1979. It went into a modest contraction over the next 20 years. It lost about 2 million jobs between 1979 and 1999. And then it fell by 22% between 1999 and 2007, uh, and by another 12% cumulatively between 2007 and 2010. It's recovered about a million jobs in the interim. And that decline is due primarily, at least between 1999 and 2007, to the trade shock. There's no, people often say the decline in manufacturing is due to you know, technological progress. There was, I don't think, I can't recall the great invention of 1999 that eliminated one in four US manufacturing jobs. I, I would submit there was no such invention uh, that was uh, trade. Um, it's important to recognize uh, how surprisingly large manufacturing looms for young men or for men more broadly. So in 1970, two thirds of young manufacturing workers were men. In 2014, three quarters of them were men. So this figure shows you the employment status of young men and young women. We're focusing on people 18 to 39 because we're looking at marriage market outcomes. Uh, and uh, the heights of the bars that go to zero to 80%, so the non-employed are not included. You can see in 1970, 23% uh, of young men were in manufacturing. Uh, another, excuse me, 55% were non-manufacturing. The remainder were not currently working. Uh, if we roll forward to 1990, it's the case that more than one, close to one in four men who were working, were working in manufacturing. And in, by 2014, uh, that was approximately one in seven. Uh, the decline has been much more rapid among women. So although manufacturing is not that large as the share of overall employment, it's a, large, it's a much larger share of men's employment. It's also the case that manufacturing work surprisingly uh, appeared to offer relatively high wages to less educated men. So comparing men of similar education, young men in the same areas, looking very, by very detailed geography, you would estimate that both men and women uh, earned uh, about 20% more in manufacturing than non-manufacturing workers in the same areas with same education, same age. A lot of that difference came not just from higher hourly wages, but from, high, from higher annual hours. So an important feature of manufacturing work relative to uh, a lot of non-manufacturing for less educated adults is that it has long and stable hours. So that's an, uh, that, that affects annual earnings and it affects the stability of employment more broadly. Okay. So the first point is simply to emphasize that manufacturing, important to young men, young adults, and fell really rapidly in this period. Uh, I want to also put this in the context of family. So again, many of you will be aware of this. Uh, there's been dramatic change in the conditions of uh, childbirth. So uh, at present, about 40% of all U.S. births are out of wedlock. Uh, that has... Uh, at relative to uh, under 20% in 1980. It's basically been, so that figure shows you data through 2009, but I looked at the 2016 data uh, just yesterday and it basically hasn't changed. Um, that differs dramatically by race. So it's 40% overall, it's 27% among whites, 70% among blacks, and 53% among Hispanics. So big race disparities, although it has risen in every group. Um, the, uh, it also dr differs dramatically by education of the mother. So this shows you the fraction of children under 18 in 1970 and 2010 who were living with the mother only as a function of education. So for example, if you look at white mothers with less than a high school degree, that rose from 12% to 42%. Among black mothers with less than a high school degree from 40% to 80%, and for, among Hispanics from 19 to 35. So out of wedlock childbearing is much, much more common than it used to be. Uh, it's, it's highly concentrated among uh, less educated adults. It's more concentrated among minorities. And it's important to recognize that, it's, uh, that being born out of wedlock is a very, a very strong predictor of being in a non-married household for a, a large chunk of childhood. It's not just a transitional stage. They didn't get around to getting married. That sometimes happens, but those households tend to be highly unstable. So you know, one thing that Nathan emphasized is in a neighborhood where a lot of parents are unmarried, it doesn't matter if your parent, you know, it's not very predictive whether your own parents are married. Um, 
I would say it's likely the case that many parents that are married at a point in time in those neighborhoods will not be necessarily married going forward. There's a lot of instability so that it's highly predictive actually of changes in marital status that may be incorrect. Nathan's giving me the, that may be incorrect look. Uh, <laughs> okay, <laughs> I think it's incorrect. Okay, the, um, the other thing to, uh, to bear in mind is that uh, par uh, marital status is a very strong predictor of poverty, even conditional on education. So among high school dropout mothers is in 2008, 60% of unmarried children, high school dropout mothers, 60% of whom, uh, of the mothers who are unmarried, the children were living in poverty versus 24% who are married. And the gaps are, you know, uh, at least uh, two to five fold across education groups. So although uh, low income uh, is, a, is a pervasive feature of low education, marital status is strongly predictive of uh, kids' uh, poverty levels, even conditional uh, on education. So another way to say that is the poverty rate among married households in the U.S. is, is about 8%. Among single mother-headed households, about 35%. Okay, so there's a lot of work on this topic, and in the interest of time, I will put it up here and not discuss it. I will simply say uh, what we think we could uh, improve upon in this, in this uh, nice body of work. Um, we felt what was missing from the evidence was one, large, really well-identified labor market shocks. Secondly, gender-specific components to those shocks that we could distinguish effects, uh, effects on men's versus women's potential earnings. Um, and third was pretty high-resolution data, although not at the track level, not, not at, the, at the website level, uh, linking labor market shocks to gender earning status, fertility, marriage, and children's outcomes. So our data put, are, come from a variety of sources. Uh, including uh, mortality and fertility, or natality files, as well as uh, earnings and employment and demographic files from the census. Um, so what we do is we exploit these well-identified trade shocks to manufacturing, uh, and we first look at labor market consequences, then we look at what we call marriageable men. Uh, I apologize if that terminology is, is, uh, is not as uh, well chosen as it could be. Uh, we look at uh, idleness, sex ratio, and mortality. Um, and these try to give us a, 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 some estimation of the set of men that may or may not be good partners from the kind of Beckerian perspective. And then we look at what we're going to call downstream effects on uh, marriage, cohabitation, and fertility. And you're going to see movements on all margins, likelihood of being married, likelihood of cohabiting, women's choices uh, about having children, and also whether they're having children uh, in or out of wedlock. And finally, how this feeds into children's household structures, the fraction of kids living uh, in married versus unmarried households and living in poverty. And as you would guess, because shocks to male earnings are going to reduce marriage rates, they are going to increase the fraction of kids living in poverty, not only because uh, they reduce incomes, but because marriage itself is so uh, protective against poverty. Okay, so to identify these shocks, we exploit uh, as we have done in other work, we use the very rapid rise in China's uh, share of all world manufacturing exports. Uh, we look at this uh, across eight other high-income countries at the product level. We use the covariance between those rises in export po exposure ex exports at the product level to other countries and with the U.S. So we're trying to isolate the supply-driven component that comes from China's rising productivity, falling costs, falling trade barriers. We project those into local labor markets according to their initial share of employment in those sectors, also controlling for manufacturing overall. So we're not we're, our objective is not to compare manufacturing-intensive places versus non-manufacturing-intensive places, but rather conditional on the overall level of manufacturing. We're trying to compare places that are concentrated in labor-intensive sectors like textiles and furniture uh, relative to much more capital-intensive sectors like uh, uh, aircraft engines, steel, heavy industry that were exposed much later to the China shock. China's initial comparative advantage was strongly in labor-intensive goods production. So a good comparison would be sort of High Point, North Carolina versus uh, <coughs> Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. They both had about the same share of manufacturing, but High Point was very concentrated in furniture and textiles, and Pittsburgh uh, was much more in heavy industry, and so the China shock was much larger in High Point than it, would be in Pittsburgh, than it was in Pittsburgh. Okay, there's a lot of work on this documenting uh, effects on manufacturing employment, effects on non-manufacturing employment, and so on. So I, I will, again, suppress discussion of that. I will also 
not talk in detail about our data. The, the main things you need to know are the trade data come from Comtrade. Uh, our outcome variables are primarily from the census, the American Community Survey, as well as uh, birth and death data from the national vitality st statistics. And we're focusing on populations 18 to 39 because we're interested in this family formation and fertility margin. Um, we're mostly combining races and ethnicities just for statistical power, although we have we, we show you uh, qualitatively, we find similar results. Um, I am going to not go through this notation. <laughs> Let me instead just show you pictorially. Um, this shows you, this is a map of exposure to Chinese import competition. Uh, darker colors represent more exposure. Um, on the right hand side is a list of the most exposed industries in terms of imports per initial worker. Uh, so furniture and fixtures, uh, if Tom Holmes were here, I'm sure he would uh, reemphasize this point about uh, furniture being a, a big point of impact. Um, uh, games, toys, and children's vehicles, sporting and athletic goods, electronic components, plastics, uh, et cetera. And this gives you an important thing to notice is a lot of this exposure is along the South and the South Atlantic, as well as in Northeast, uh, much less in other parts of the country. So a lot of this actually, in fact, these are the same colors that Nathan's figure apply to these areas, although uh, his is, uh, you know, refers to an earlier, earlier period. Um, to give you a sense of what do these trade shocks look like, um, this shows you uh, percentiles of the shock in terms of, effectively you can think of this in terms of local area GDP. So the median commuting zone uh, had, uh, had about 1% of GDP displaced uh, between 1990 and 2007, uh, and about uh, uh, a similar amount in the second period, but the tail is longer. If you then break that down, into exposure of men versus women. Let me tell you how we do that. We look at the industry exposure calculated using this matrix of product level shocks projected into uh, commuting zone industry mix. We then look at the share of men and women in each of those industries, and we just allocate the shock proportionally to men and women as a function of the initial share. So if it's a shock of one and 60% of the employment uh, in that industry is men, then we say 0.6 of the shock goes to men, 0.4 to women. And what you can see is the shocks are generally about twice as large among men as among women. So that tells us two things. One, on average, the shock was going to be uh, more directly impacting male employment. And secondly, that we'll be able to distinguish places where more of the shock is allocated to men, more to women. We can simultaneously control for that or account for that. And it works surprisingly well, as I will show you. OK. so. Uh, the first margin I want to look at is the labor market side. Um, and I want to emphasize um, these are shocks that emanate from the labor market level. We can't say they exclusively operate through employment or through the people who are in manufacturing because they change the opportunity set of all uh, folks in an area. So I don't want you to think of this as only what happens to displaced manufacturing workers. That would not be uh, accurate. Okay, so. First, let me show you the initial effect on manufacturing employment. So our basic OLS, OLS estimate, uh, if we just use all the variation in trade exposure, not the part that we can isolate causally, you would say, oh, about a 1% displacement of GDP uh, reduces manufacturing employment in a local labor market by about 1.1%. Uh, the second uh, uh, column shows you when we instrument this. We instrument it, we get a slightly larger negative effect, about 1.7 percentage points. Where does that, why is uh, instrumenting increase the magnitude? Because the, uh, you would expect that the, the, the OLS component, the naive component, mixes uh, demand shocks and supply shocks, right? So a demand shock will both bring in imports and raise domestic employment. Uh, and so those would work in opposite directions in terms of manufacturing employment. The component that we hope to be isolating just stemming from uh, import shocks, that should just compete with domestic employment, not raise it. Then we put in a large number of controls. And the main thing to take away is our results are pretty stable, uh, pretty robust. We also do a falsification exercise where we look in earlier periods. And uh, you find uh, we find comparable re results in the 90s and 2000s, no relationship in the 1980s. If you go back far enough to the 1970s, you actually see a, a positive relationship. This likely reflects that a lot of this exposure occurred in the South and South Atlantic. Those are the areas where manufacturing grew a lot 
during the 1970s as U.S. firms moved out of unionized uh, northern cities and into the South. Okay, so now let me talk about the effects that we see. The first is on in manufacturing employment. So this shows you separately by gender. We see a decline in manufacturing employment among both men and women, uh, partly offset by, un excuse me, this is overall employment, I apologize. Uh, uh, a decline in employment among men and women, partly offset by a rise in unemployment, partly upset, uh, offset by a rise in non-participation. You should think of these as over kind of a 10-year horizon. Right? So this is, not a necessarily, this is certainly not a permanent effect. Um, this shows you the difference. So although these shocks affect both men and women's employment, they have a larger negative effect on uh, men relative to women. Uh, and uh, let me just, in the interest of time, just move forward on this. Um, this shows you the effects across the distribution of earnings, including zero. So here we're using the kind of group quantile instrumental variable estimator of uh, Chet Virikoff, Larson, and Palmer. And uh, the blue line corresponds to uh, changes in male earnings percentiles, the red to female earnings percentiles. So you can see that in absolute terms, the effects are larger at the top of the distribution. But of course, earnings levels are larger at the top of the distribution as well. So if we instead scale this by initial male earnings, and we say the loss, the change in the male-female gap relative to initial male earnings, you see that the proportionate losses are substantially larger below the median. In other words, these shocks differentially depress the earnings of low earnings males relative to low earnings women's, women. <laughs> uh, so I think that's important because it suggests that although these you know, generally are adverse for employment in an area, they're particularly uh, likely to affect the earnings potential of men who are already fairly close, uh, fairly low in the earnings distribution. So that's the employment and earnings side. Now I want to look at the non-labor market side. So I'm going to look at three different outcomes. Idleness, which is just non-participation, uh, neither work nor schooling. Uh, absence, meaning the, the actual presence of men in the labor market. And third is mortality. Um, so uh, we know there's, there's actually a lot of interesting work on educational investment. There's also work uh, on uh, how men are using their time. There's a, a, a controversial paper by Agri Aguiar and others looking at video game use as a hypothesis for declining male labor force participation. Um, we look, here I'm going to look at the youngest adults in our sample, ages 18 to 25. And what we see is these shocks strongly reduce employment among men and women, but much more among we uh, men. We already knew this, but now we're focused on the youngest. They also increase the fraction in school not employed. And in fact, I will say there, there's work by Greenland and Loprezzi that actually shows that there are some positive educational effects. This is also related to work by uh, Hearst, uh, Noderigdo, and others showing that uh, when housing booms collapse, people go to school more. And then we also see a strong increase in male idleness. So all the decline in female employment is compensated for by a rise in uh, female school going. But for men, about half of it uh, appears to lead to, uh, be associated with an increase in idleness, meaning neither at work nor in school. There's no uh, census checkbox for video game uh, play, but uh, it could be that. Um, so this just shows you that differential. Uh, a second margin that is relevant, and I emphasize these margins because when we're thinking next about marriage and fertility, this will obviously be a relevant consideration for any, uh, any potential uh, partner. Um, this shows you the effects on the gender ratio, meaning the ratio of men to women, uh, ages uh, 18 to 25, 18 to 39. That ratio is typically about uh, 0.96, uh, and it does decline in response to these shocks. Um, and that appears uh, it, it could operate through several channels. Um, let me just list them. Uh, one could be migration. Um, uh, other work by Alex Bardic uh, finds, uh, well, this is actually summarized in Janet's paper. There's, there's uh, last version I saw of that paper and just saw no gender specific migration component. Uh, military enlistment explains some of this in data that, that was given to us by the, uh, by the US Army. We do see a rise in military enlistments among men when there are economic downturns. Um, some of this could be due to incarceration. So uh, we would not see men in local labor markets if they are sent to non-local jails. Um, 
And then a final channel of interest is mortality. Uh, and of course, you're all familiar with the work by Case and Deaton looking at deaths of despair. Those are primarily focused on adults over 40. So we're going to look at young adults. And uh, we find uh, well estimated and meaningful, though not enormous, effects on mortality. So the outcome variable here is the, uh, the decadal difference in male versus female mortality per 100,000 adults among those ages 20 to 39. And so just to give you a baseline, uh, the mean decadal mortality rate among men is about 1,645, among women is about 709. So this gap is 930, so large gap. This increase of 64 says a one unit shock, which is about the median that we're looking at, increases that gap by about 65 additional deaths per 100,000. So that's roughly a, you know, slightly less than a 10% increase in uh, relative more male mortality. Um, a good chunk of that is coming from drug and alcohol poisoning. Uh, an equally large amount is coming from HIV. Uh, and, a, and some, although not precisely estimated, from homicide as well. And then the rest falls into other categories. So not all of these would be called deaths of despair. So I don't think Case and Deaton uh, labeled uh, HIV as a death of despair or homicide for that matter. Um, but uh, this is, what, uh, this is uh, what comes out. You can also look at this separately by sex and look at sex-specific shocks. And there you find much larger effects. Uh, so we find just a sh holding constant women's labor force status, the shock to men raises male mortality by about 240 per, uh, per 100,000. That's, uh, that's more than a 10% increase. Um, when you look specifically at drug and alcohol poisoning, um, that's not an enormous number over 10 years, right? 83 additional deaths. It is enormous relative to the baseline. So it's an epidemic increase, even though quantitatively it's that not that large a change. Uh, OK, we have similar results for women, but I'm, I'm going to, uh, in the interest of time, let me just move forward. So just to summarize, uh, and then I'll present the last set of results, at the county, at the county's community zone level, we see these shocks. They differentially reduce male employment and earnings. They seem to lead to other adverse behaviors among men, so a rise in idleness, uh, a reduction in the presence of men in the local area, and uh, a rise in mortality. And probably something that's important to stress about that rise in mortality is uh, only a, uh, the number of men who actually uh, uh, permanently leave the labor market because of mortality is small. But of course, if more men are engaged in criminal activity or engaged in illicit drug use, uh, that would clearly affect their marriage market uh, uh, suitability, desirability. And so I think you should think of that as an extreme tail event relative to a large change in the overall set of activities in which people are engaged. So more people are affected than uh, actually uh, experience the worst potential outcome. So a, a summary statement is that we see young men differentially faring poorly over a 10-year period in these trading back to locations. So finally, I want to look at uh, family and marriage. So the first thing we look at is the marital status of women 18 to 39. And this is uh, interesting and, and strongly confirmatory of the Becker hypothesis. So first, uh, we see a decline in male earnings uh, reduces the fraction of women married by about 3.6 percentage points. That's on a base of about 45% in this age group. So that's a substantial decline. Uh, and mostly, it does that by reducing the fraction ever entering into marriage. Uh, the overall divorce rate in, uh, at that age is under 20%. Noticeably, you also find that shocks to women's earnings, adverse shocks, raise marriage. Right? So this would be consistent with the specialization model where relative earnings matter. So uh, holding male earnings constant, a decline in women's earnings actually raises the fraction of women who are, who are married. And we will see that again in a number of other results. Um, if you look at cohabitation, um, this is primarily not uh, uh, due to reduction in marriage compensated by a rise in unmarried cohabitation. It just seems to reduce the fraction of men and women who are living together, or the fraction of women who are living with partners. Um, and now I'll finally turn to these children's outcomes. So the first one to look at is birth rates. And again, uh, I, I found these results quite striking. 
So we know that fertility is countercyclical. Uh, excuse me, is cyclical. Sorry, rises when uh, the economy is in uh, in good shape. And so, not surprisingly, um, a re, you know a decline in local economic activity appears to reduce the birth rate. However, again, we find a shock to male earnings reduces the birth rate. A shock to female earnings raises the birth rate, holding male earnings constant. Right. So that again, speaks to that specialization story. Um, so we know marriage declines. And we know fertility declines. And so not surprisingly, the fraction of women with children declines. However, the fraction who are of mothers who are unmarried strongly increases. Right? So although there's a decline in marital formation, decline in fertility, uh, it is not all uh, the, the fertility that we, some of the fertility still is non-marital fertility. So the net effect is to reduce the number of kids but raise the fraction of kids who are born to single moms. So if we want to. Um, look at how this affects poverty and household structure. So the first thing to see is that uh, a one unit shock raises the fraction of children under li living in poverty by about 0.6 percentage points. That's on a base of around 18%, so it's not a small number. Um, and you can also see that it changes the distribution of kids across household types. So the decline of kids living in married households a rise living in single parent households and grandparent had added households, which is about 10% of kids. Um, so if you ask where does that poverty occur, most of the growth in poverty is among single parent households. So we see a rise in overall poverty. A lot of that is occurring by more a larger fraction of kids being in poor single parent households. And just I'll take only one more minute because I realize I'm out of time. Um, if we look on living arrangements, again, you see the striking role of men's versus women's earnings. A decline in men's earnings reduces the number of kids living with married parents. A decline in women's earnings raises the number of kids. Uh, similarly, a decline in male earnings raises the fraction of kids living in uh, unmarried households. A decline in women's earnings reduces that. Right. So things that uh, things that reduce women's labor market potential appear to be protective of children's poverty and household structure, and conversely, for men. And so finally, if you look at household structure and poverty, what's going on? Well, we find a shock to male earnings raises the fraction of kids living in poverty, primarily by raising the fraction of kids living in poor non-married households. And a shock to women's earnings actually does not raise childhood poverty at all. And that's because the composition of kids across households moves in the direction of married households and away from single parent households. OK, so just to conclude, uh, the, uh, we, we, many of you are all aware of this shock to manufacturing and its important employment impacts. Um, and it appears especially consequential in this context because men are overrepresented in manufacturing uh, and because particularly young non college men had particularly high and stable earnings in manufacturing. So this shock not only reduced employment, but differentially reduced the earnings and employment prospects of less educated men. Uh, this had broader consequences for male economic function or dysfunction, if you like, not just on labor market margins, but on inactivity, uh, on uh, uh, engaging in risky and dangerous behavior. Also, there's evidence on crime. And then finally, and potentially most consequential and related to what Nathan was presenting earlier, uh, it did change the set of circumstances that children were facing, uh, reducing the number who are living in parent ho two parent households, raising the number living in poverty by non trivial amounts. Now, it's also important to recognize that there, there may be countervailing positive effects, particularly on educational investment. And so, I, this does not, uh, it does, this certainly doesn't imply that all kids who were exposed to the shock you know, face terrible long term prospects. But, uh, it does appear that it created additional challenges in the uh, set of uh, household circumstances they were facing. Thanks very much. Thank you very much to all our speakers. It's been uh, perfectly on time, uh, first panel. And now it's uh, the time to open up to questions. So I would like to ask, like, uh, uh, just start these questions and then open up to the audience. And it looks like uh, not only that 
all these um, presentations were incredibly interesting, but so well, you know, they were fitting together so well, and we learned a lot about the effects of uh, exposure, right? So exposure effects, uh, either they're coming from uh, fracking or from poverty, exposure to poverty or exposure to trade shocks and to China. So at the end of the day, earnings and uh, marriage patterns and uh, uh, job prospects, they seem all uh, very much linked and determined by exposure, exposure to local um, uh, effects. So the other thing that was uh, in common across this presentation was, uh, um, you know, the compositional effects are important. So um, where you grow up or where you work is important because the composition of the uh, people around you, employed or unemployed, uh, married and single, and uh, uh, working in one industry or the other is important in terms of uh, your um, success. So the pool of people is important. And that there is a lot of heterogeneity. And that uh, these effects are very local. That's why we, we observe so much heterogeneity. So we saw two of these um, um, effects, at least, you know, like we look at the mon monotonic de decline of uh, uh, the effect of um, uh, the poverty rate, as well as the effect on health, looked like uh, the monotone decline and, um, uh, was uh, very sharp already after a mile or two, it seemed like uh, these effects were vanishing. So very local effects, exposure effects are important, lots of heterogeneity. Now my question for you, for our speakers is, um, how do we use this knowledge to think about policy. So bring it back to the um, you know, place-based policy theme of uh, this uh, panel. And in particular, I'm thinking about the dynamic effects and what we can think about when we move people across. It seems like one formula could be, let's just move everybody to a good neighborhood or let's just you know, like make every neighbor look good. But then you, know, you sort of have to think about the dynamic implications and how uh, prices will eventually change and how people will move in response to this, um, you know, changing in prices and policies. And so the composition will change again and then maybe, you know, maybe the effects that you were expecting, they're not exactly the ones that you end up with. So how to think about, you know, designing policies uh, at the local level. The other, quest the other complication might be that um, in a world with a lot of inequality, you know, rich people that are becoming richer over time may have other means to sort of like get around our place ball, you know, uh, place based policies. I'm thinking about parents that send kids to private school once you just put in place a fantastic policy that says all kids should go to the same neighbor uh, public school, but they actually you know, end up doing something else, or end up migrate and uh, choose a different neighborhood. And so the mixing becomes harder to achieve. So if composition is important, how do we implement it? And how do we think about the dynamic effects, especially in a world where inequality is on the rise? Yes, all of you. <laughs> I'll say something about that. Just uh, stir things up a bit. I, I actually don't think place-based policies on average are a good idea. I think policy should be person-based. Sure. And I think you see a lot of examples from what we were talking about of exactly why um, you know, it doesn't necessarily work to have a place-based policy. So in my particular example with fracking, here you have a policy. A lot of money went into the neighborhood. Not everybody benefits, and you can see that you know, the schools didn't get any better, the hospitals didn't get any better. So you know, the people that are dependent on those things are not benefiting. Um, and you, you were sort of saying jokingly, well, you know, why don't we just move everybody to a better neighborhood? Well, why not? You know, to me, that's a more sensible policy than trying to take every neighborhood and make it a, a, a better place when that isn't actually a great way to target resources. So that's sure. my two cents on that. Those are great points. I mean, I think these are really tough questions. I, I see it sort of in, a, in stages. Um, I think, you know, from us, we're trying to understand first, you try to see, take it in the stage of first try to understand to what extent do families want to be in better neighborhoods and are not moving there 
just because of constraints. We see that sort of as a first step to just understanding notions of, of preferences. And then I think the second step is to understand a lot of the interactions that you describe. Like, mm. I think we can look at the impact of uh, a child moving on that right. child's outcomes in adulthood. But that is, of course, not looking at what happens in the origin neighborhood when the child leaves and what happens at the destination yeah. when the child arrives and what is the endogeneity of place in response to composition. On the one hand, you could think of neighborhoods as purely mattering because uh, of who is living there. On the other hand, you can think of neighborhoods as mattering purely because they have sort of a, a, a static production function, almost a, 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 you know, if there's, a, if there's lead in the water, there's, there's lead in the water. Now, <laughs> these are, of course, related because it might be the politicians and the political system from the people there that put the lead in the water. So I think these are all very, very tough kind of complicated distinctions. And my gut at the end of the day says that there's probably some places uh, or some cases where place-based policy makes sense because there's something about the place that is generating you know, externalities on other places, kind of these classic mm -hmm. public finance type rationales that we have for targeting particular, uh, uh, particular policies, in, policies in particular places. But there might be other uh, cases where really just focusing on changes in the national, uh, mm -hmm. uh, national policies and national uh, treatment of, uh, uh, of education, for example, could be a way of going. I think it's a, a, the tough questions that you're asking. Can I, can I actually just respond also? Uh, so I, I generally, I agree sort of at a thousand feet up from what, what Janet said, but I think there are reasons to not move to this corner solution. Uh, one is that it's, it's very difficult to move a lot of people, and, and the mobility rates we know differ greatly by education, by age, where younger and more educated people are much more mobile. And so if you sort of move half the people out, uh, the, the potential for uh, you know, adverse effects on the remainder is quite large and you'd, be, you'd have a lot of trouble. Uh, you, yeah. So that, that would be an unattractive uh, attribute. Also, in many cases, there are real, you know, kind of a flow of quasi-rents of investments that are coming off from a place in terms of its industry, its housing structure, its school system, uh, its healthcare system. It may have long-standing educational institutions. And uh, we certainly just moving people away. Now, maybe that's, that's not the only policy you're advocating. Obviously, there could be lots of other types of targeted assistance. <laughs> but uh, I think there is, um, and, and then a, a different but related point is um, targeting individuals is, is much harder than, or different from many things that create economic activity that have lots of positive spillovers, right? So right now, we have a very, very tight labor market. That, that's a, if we had that as a policy, we don't know how to do that. But it has huge benefits that doesn't require anyone to move anywhere and doesn't require a lot of targeting. Right? It raises earnings, it raises employment to population rates, it, it deters all kinds of bad behavior. And so you could think, well, if I had a policy that could create that type of you know, resurgence in a few places, I would, and it wasn't too expensive, that would be really attractive. I wouldn't have to target anyone, I wouldn't have to screen individually, uh, and I wouldn't have to only help the least advantaged. Maybe just creating affluence around me would, would do a lot of good. And uh, and given the declines in mobility of the po U.S. population we've seen over the last 20 years, there's a, a stronger argument for place-based policies than there used to be. Can, just make, can I make one more point on Yeah, of course. And I think there's also a distinction when you think about place-based policies about if we're talking about adults versus kids. Because I think when we think about kids, I think it's, it's a very local environment. Like I think of a half-mile radius, but probably most of us work and, and travel more than a half-mile to our jobs. And I think that sort of is a distinction to keep in mind, again, thinking about the place as production of human capital versus place as sort of production. Um, and that likely is going to have different, uh, different effects. Right. So yes, what I meant to say in the sense that it was going to be harder to move everybody to a better place is exactly that the composition of these neighborhoods are endogenous. So eventually, richer people or uh, people that can afford may eventually decide to move out or you know to send the kids to a uh, private school that is more expensive. I'll make so, one more comment on this too which is my mother grew up in a place called Forest Green Missouri which was a pretty depressed place when she was growing up there and it's in rural Missouri and she moved fortunately for me and that place no longer exists. So even when I was a kid, there was just, there was a gas station, a corner store, and a post office, and now there isn't anything there at all. So that's kind of sad in a way, 
but it's much better for everybody yeah. as far as I'm concerned that you know we weren't all stuck there so yeah it's hard for people to move but that's not a reason to say that therefore we should only do place-based policies maybe we should help people move right and the fact that it's easier to do a place-based policy than targeting also to me is not really a very persuasive argument for place-based policies. Okay, let's uh, see if whether we have yes questions from the audience. We have mics that are going around, so please introduce yourself and then. Um, I'm Maud um, Toussaint Como from the Chicago Fed. And thank you so much for a great panel. I really learned a lot. I agree with you. Um, so um, my question is for um, David Arthur. Um, in light of the sort of different result for men versus women, um, what do you think the implication on children behaviors is? Um, do they sort of mimic the, you know, bad sort of outcome in behavior of their uh, fathers, or um, is sort of the counter result for female in terms of time utilization, in time that you know they have with their children, sort of counter act those potential bad effect on the children, even if you see that poverty increase for children. And what are really the policy implications of um, sort of shocks from manufacturing on um, parents and potential effect on children? Uh, thanks uh, for that question, Maude. The, uh, I mean, I, I think that we know from, from some of the work I've done, from some of the work that Raj and Nathan has done, um, that the effects actually appear to differ a lot by the gender of the kids. Uh, and that differences in, in outcomes are much more dispersed among boys than among girls. And uh, in general, the neighborhood, adverse neighborhood effects appear much more adverse for boys than they do for girls. Similarly, um, single parent families are associated with significantly worse outcomes for the sons than the daughters. Uh, and you could give a number of explanations for that. One explanation may be that just, you know, boys are the fragile sex, right? They just uh, are more likely to malfunction under given any uh, adverse growing conditions. Um, uh, another possibility, of course, is differences in role models, that in most single parent households are mother-headed households, and you know, daughters may be learning a lesson that they need to be both you know, educated and responsible and working, and sons are learning a different set of messages. That's also possible. So I, th so I think that in terms of thinking about kids, there is a, a propagation uh, that we see of these outcomes, and it, it works for the differential gender behavior of boys and girls. Uh, in terms of policy, you know, this this brings us back to the big question. I mean, it's an irony that none of us addressed policies, right? We we were, these are none of these are there was you know the China shock was not a a, a place based policy, nor was fracking, uh, uh, nor was the Opportunity Atlas, <laughs> um, and so these are you know, and, and I think it's important to say that you know many of the oftentimes the policies have nothing to do with the source of the problem, right? The you know the 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 answer to the quote China shock is not necessarily has nothing to do with trade or may have nothing to do with trade. So there I think I'll, I'll just leave that for a broader discussion. So actually with fracking there is a policy question which is do you want to allow it or not? And places have taken mm -hmm. radically different views on that and I actually think that's totally reasonable because you know, different places are starting from different positions, the benefits are, are widely different. So there's an argument that that is a decision that should be made at a local level. And so what I was suggesting in terms of policy was that, you know, giving people more information to make those kind of decisions in a sensible way might help the overall effect to be more beneficial. Uh, Janet, it's over here to, the le to your right, it's Neil. I um, appreciate your comments on uh, on fracking. You know, North Dakota and the Bakken is part of our Federal Reserve District, so every year I go out there, and I've never been there before, uh, and I was just there a few months ago. Your findings are consistent with what I find anecdotally. I mean, I think most people that I meet in North Dakota feel overwhelmingly positive that it's been a boom for the state, their economy is better off. And the first few years of the boom, it seemed like they were just desperate trying to keep up with the boom. And now, in the last few years, they've been catching up and investing in new schools and new infrastructure that improves the quality of life. So I think 
if you, if you continue to study it, you may find that some of these other sectors are in fact now are seeing benefits to the general population. One question I had for you, I believe North Dakota and maybe some other states have an extraction tax that goes to the state, that funds the state's general fund, that then would accrue benefits to everybody. Was that captured in your analysis? I wasn't sure about that. No, I was just looking at the local um, taxes, so that's a good point. And th actually, that's sort of what I was saying at the end, was that you need some sort of mechanism for sharing the wealth. So if you have one county that's getting all the revenue, it makes a lot of sense for it to go to the state and then fund, you know, um, fund benefits for everybody. Uh, Morris Kleiner, University of Minnesota and Federal Reserve Bank of Minneapolis. have a question for David and uh, then a sort of a policy question. Um, uh, some of the other uh, papers that look at decline manufacturing put the cause in terms of immigration and robots. A uh, paper by uh, Borjas and Freeman uh, really put, put the uh, the decline in manufacturing uh, on that. How do, how do you do that in terms of the horse race of trade versus these other causes? And second, the, the political issue is politicians uh, are all usually in favor of place-based policies. You can't think of many politicians who would want a moving to opportunity uh, set of policies. They want uh, policies that r result in, in training and, and other policies taking place at their location, not encouraging people to move out of their uh, congressional district. And how do you counter that? Okay, I'm going to punt on the second one. Um, <laughs> I'm going to hand it to Nathan. Uh, on immigration, robots, and, and trade. So I, I don't think, I, I'm not aware of the research that says immigration led to a decline in U.S. manufacturing. Um, but on the robot side, there is, of course, well-known work by Asimoglu and Restrepo uh, that looks at this. I, I think a couple things to say about that. One is the robot phenomenon is much more recent. We're looking at period 1990, a lot of our actions 1990 to 2007. Um, so they're actually temporarily somewhat dis disparate. Second, they're in different places. There's almost no correlation between the places that were most impacted by China and the ones most impacted by potential robotics because uh, robots are in heavy industry. They're, they're almost exclusively in automotive. Uh, and so that's not a labor-intensive sector, uh, and it's a so it's a different uh, different set of locations, different set of industries, different set of workers. Um, it also bears emphasis that they're not actually measuring robots; uh, they're measuring uh, they're imputing robots based on survey data that may or may not be present. So I think there's more measurement that's needed uh, to be as confident in that set of findings as we'd like. I think it's ex excellent work, but there's still uh, it, it is just they are up against a pretty hard data constraint. Um, so I don't think it's it's either or. I think you know automation robotics has been so automation broadly has been incredibly important for the evolution of manufacturing since the Second World War. Uh, it just uh, that has caused economists to think that trade was was not really very important, and that's turned out to be true except for a certain period in, in which it, at which point it became extremely important. <laughs> uh, I think, but you know, if we ask what what will be the key drivers of manufacturing employment going forward, it could very well be. Automation. It could, also, it could also be automation in a positive sense that there will be, at least for the U.S., there could be reshoring of formerly labor-intensive activities uh, to our shores, where we will use automation instead of labor. That that will be disastrous for much of the world, but it'll, good for it'll make America great again. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have to follow that. <laughs> um, so just on the policy uh, question, I guess to, uh, two things to say. You know, I think I, I don't have much to say. I guess on the. Uh, the question of do politicians, are they for or against kind of moving to opportunity policies, although I would be interested in, in folks' thoughts in the break about what the mortgage interest deduction is if we think about uh, pol policies for, the, for more affluent kid, uh, kids, but perhaps not less affluent kids. Uh, on the question of sort of how far do you have to move to move to opportunity, one of the things we've been most struck with is how local uh, these, uh, this variation is and how you can find neighborhoods that are just around, uh, you know, uh, uh, less than a half mile away that are, that are quite different. And so I think um, that suggests that a lot of these issues really, you know, we can talk about what to do at a national level, but there's a lot to do even at a local level for thinking about these kinds of policies. Thanks. So, David, I just have two quick comments. Um, one is thank you for clarifying the issue with manufacturing. 
but I think it does beg that you think about your paper a little differently. So from like 1979 to 1999, when technology was very important in us having a declining share of workers in manufacturing, but the same number of workers, but those same workers were getting older. So what, what, what people misunderstand is most technological advance was incumbents playing the insider game, keeping their job, and that's how we absorbed it for the most part. And that's a decomposition thing that you can do. Looking at the increasing age of manufacturing workers, it pretty much maps out. But that means that opportunities then change for younger workers who didn't have access. And as you rightly point out, the reason why people are angry is when machines took the place of workers on the outside, which is what really happened, you don't get incumbent workers very angry because their wages are going up, they're more productive. However, the trade, there are people who tell stories. It's not a robot came in and I lost my job. It's my factory disappeared. This is a totally different world. It's a different shock. So I think it would be interesting to see technology changes opportunity sets for younger men. The trade shock actually destroys jobs in the midst of someone who's an incumbent who thought I, I had made the right investments. It's just two, two different worlds. You're, I, I think you were unfair to yourself by having a chart that said it, it was marriage, not children, and then later you did what I thought you should have done the first time, which was it, it's far more complex. It's actually your chart on marriage, not children, really was a change in composition, which later on you point out there's a change in composition for a reason. Overall, childbirths dropped, and this is true especially in the African-American community. So a lot of people make a big deal about share of children born out of wedlock as if the number of children born has stayed the same. It's not. It's, it's declined for women out of wedlock. It's declined faster for married women, and the number of women who are married has declined. So a lot more activity is on the things that you were modeling, which is decline in marriage rates and a dramatic <laughs> decline in the size of married black families. The, they are way smaller than they used to be. Um, and you and I both sat through a very interesting paper on the Japan effect for black men in manufacturing. And I think that's an important part to add in because it helps to set the rest of your paper because if, if you look at that, that's the, the story of the 70s and the 80s, which mirrors what Wilson was talking about. And, and I, think it, I, I think it would just strengthen it. Um, uh, Nathan, so my question is, the, and we're talking about place-based strategies. Uh, so the, we, 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 and we've talked about moving. So I'll use Flint, Michigan, because that's my other hometown, because it's my wife's hometown. Not mine, but my wife's. Um, but we've been married for you know almost 35 years. So, um, <laughs> so it's a weighty combination of your hometown and her. Yeah. Time. So, uh, <laughs> so in in the case of Flint, you have everything David said. You you have an infrastructure, which you can't really just move the people and think it doesn't have consequences because what has actually happened in Flint is all the people were able to be moved, and now you have these consequences like you don't have safe water. Um, but what, what, what you show is that it's within place. So, so even, even if I just wanted to say, okay, it's Flint versus Minneapolis, but this variation within, that, you, that within a city that you point out. So you already have information on people who move and the characteristics of who moves and who doesn't move. Um, have you played with that to get a bound on understanding the question you were just asking. What are the limits? Because clearly it, it's not like I, I don't have information. If I'm in Flint, I don't have information about another labor market. This is, I'm in Minneapolis. I should have information about other neighborhoods. So when you look at the movements that people make and people who move and don't move, can't you get a bound on what are the barriers? Why don't we see those optimal decisions? And if we don't see them, then how much of this is really endogenous to some other forces? And, and therefore, it may not be as causal as one thinks. 
there, there, there's some other element there. And, and are there other barriers that you might detect that are part of this endogeneity? Sure, so. Should I, we yeah. get a, another question too? Because we are running out of time. Yeah, I saw this hand up for a while. And then maybe you can answer all together. Yeah. Great, thanks. Um, Emily Garpachetti at the Cleveland Fed. So my question was for uh, Janet, and it kind of piggybacks on your question, Neil. Um, and that is, um, have you thought about uh, those like very localized um, uh, practices um, where places are reinvesting um, back into education and long-term gains? And then in that kind of longer term, um, thinking, have you thought about the long-term costs also? So you did a little bit of like the expenditures, which I like to see because it balances out the benefits. But then I'm thinking like, okay, fracking, there's a limited life cycle to fracking, right? So as places are investing in the infrastructure and the, um, and the roads and the transportation that showed up in your data, um, are they... Uh, putting some money away for the maintenance of those roads and infrastructure that was created. And, and I didn't see that addressed here. And I think especially for fracking, it would be important because it's time limited. Um, so that was one. And then David, uh, I, I can't help but think that you, you flew through the last like 10 slides <laughs> and I was trying to catch up with some of the, some of the bar graphs, but um, uh, I'd be curious if you looked at kind of a, in this idleness that you talked about, where if there's a shock to men's employment, there um, it's not made up for by education, whereas for women it is. I'd be curious if you looked at the rebalancing of childcare and household activities, because that wasn't in your list of. I'm I'm the optimist, right? Yeah. All this <laughs> all this kind of dark stuff um, about deaths of despair. I'm kind of looking for the for the positive storyline here, and there might be some of just a culture of rebalancing and reshifting responsibilities. Um, great. And I wonder if that plays out at all. No. So let's have one minute each for <laughs> a very great finale. <laughs> So I, unfortunately, I don't think that's the, right, the, the case in what we're seeing. I mean, you, these are just absent fathers. Uh, it's, it's very unlikely that they're, they're not married, but they're more engaged as caregivers. Uh, I don't think that's what we're seeing. I mean, there may be, there may be a cross generations, there may be a, a rebalancing, but I, I think in many cases uh, there's a, uh, and the, you know, this, this is not my work that I, I speak up, so, but you know, that, if, uh, that, that there's been a real change. The fraction of men who are living in households with kids has fallen enormously. The fraction of women living in households with kids has not fallen very much, uh, and so many of these fathers are uh, not uh, not present in at least uh, yeah. Cool. Okay. So uh, I guess a couple okay. things. So on the moving to opportunity thing, to the extent to which there's a negative effect on the neighborhood that's left behind uh, when people move out, I think that's clearly an important thing to keep in mind when we think about the difference between kind of place-based approaches versus a moving to opportunity policy. And I think we just don't know enough about the uh, impact of moving a child, uh, moving a family out on the, uh, on what happens to the neighbor, uh, to the neighborhood that's left behind. Our moves are really, uh, second piece of your point, our causal effects that I showed you are all based on the set of equilibrium moves that people chose to make. And so we think we have valid causal estimates for those kids who's in, who are in families who are making those equilibrium moves. But there could be different effects on families who are induced to move in other settings. In MTO, we see and rationalize MTO, those were induced moves, but in a sense. Um, but we see the key question is really understanding to what extent, if you relax the barriers for families to move to these better neighborhoods, do they actually move? And so I think that's something we're working on but don't have a solid answer on yet. Thanks a lot. Last award to Janet. Okay, so the sort of difference in difference event study design that I'm looking at is good for looking at short run effects but not good for looking at long run effects. So I can't really say you know, whether all these places are putting the money away for a rainy day for when the fracking runs out or uh, what, to what extent they're going to start investing in schools and hospitals. All I can say is that it's not the case that all of them were doing that right off the bat. And I, I think this goes back to what uh, Morris Kleiner was asking about, was just, um, you know, yeah, of course politicians want to have place-based policies. Of course they want the government to spend money in their congressional district. That doesn't mean that it's a good idea. Thank you very much. Let's <laughs>